Hi, I'm Stephanie Harvey. And I'm Ann Goodbus. Welcome to What Every Teacher Needs to Know About Reading Comprehension Instruction. We recorded this conversation with David Pearson near his home in Berkeley, California. David currently serves as the Dean of the Graduate School of Education at the University of California at Berkeley. David's research focuses on issues of reading instruction and reading assessment policies and practices at all levels, local, state, and national. We designed this DVD with the goal of providing a focal point for conversations about reading comprehension instruction. Increasingly, we are asked about the research that undergirds our work in reading comprehension. Since we began our comprehension work 15 years ago, we have consistently turned to David Pearson for guidance and inspiration. As a researcher with a practitioner's knowledge of kids, how they learn, how they think, how they understand, David is both thoughtful and passionate about reading comprehension. His research context has always been working in classrooms, in real schools, and his work is based in a profound respect for the contribution of classroom teachers. Much of our recent work has focused on translating the research on comprehension instruction into classroom practice, and there is an incredible amount of research in this area. For more than 30 years, David Pearson and many other researchers have investigated strategies that proficient readers use to understand what they read. He and others discovered that when kids are explicitly taught to ask questions, draw inferences, and activate background knowledge, it makes a real difference in how well readers understand what they read. David's work reminds us that when we teach reading, we must remember to teach the reader, not merely the reading. This keeps us focused on moving readers towards independence. When readers are explicitly taught strategies to understand what they read, they can use those strategies flexibly in different contexts, genres, and tasks. Explicit instruction in reading comprehension is time intensive, but when kids become truly independent readers, we know that time has been well spent. As teachers, we all need to be informed about current professional knowledge. David continues to push our thinking about instruction, content learning, how kids write and talk about their reading, assessment, and other critical issues. We thank David Pearson for bridging the worlds of the researcher and the classroom teacher as we continue to learn from him. With this DVD, we hope you can learn more from David as well in school and district professional development efforts, in pre-service courses and seminars, and in other staff development settings. Teachers with lots of experience using comprehension strategies, as well as those who are just getting started, will benefit from the DVD. The DVD is divided into key topics that can lead to many professional conversations. You can watch the segments individually, or you can watch the DVD in its entirety. Either way you use the DVD, you'll learn from David's knowledge and experience with reading comprehension instruction, just as we have over the years. We're glad you've decided to use our conversation with David as a starting point for your conversations. We hope you enjoy what every teacher needs to know about reading comprehension instruction. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today to have this conversation. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. It's good to see both of you. Thank you. The research on reading comprehension, as we all know, has a long and distinguished history. So talk to us a little bit about particularly some implications that it has for, for educational practice and, and classroom work. Sure. Well, I, actually, I, I don't think there's anything more rel relevant to classroom work than reading comprehension, <laughs> and in particular, reading comprehension instruction. And to really understand its genesis, you have to go back to a period of time um, in the 60s when we really didn't think that reading comprehension instruction was very important. As a matter of fact, there was an old saying that people had that, you know, you, uh, you, uh, that decoding can be taught, but comprehension has to be caught. And I actually think that that was a, a, a really uh, uh, inappropriate uh, stance toward reading comprehension because it implied that we could teach t kids to decode, but the deg degree to which you comprehended depended entirely on your background experience, the language you brought, and the like. And we know all that's important, but we also know that we have to get beyond that and we have to help kids figure out uh, how to um, uh, solve problems from, for themselves, to think on their feet, as, if you will, as they're, as they're reading. 
But when I entered the field, which was in the 60s, um, there wasn't much going on in comprehension instruction. And when people talked about reading, they talked about reading as a perceptual process, mm -hmm. getting the letters off the page and transforming them into sounds and listening to them. And it really wasn't until the psycholinguistic movement uh, of the, um, of the uh, middle to late 60s, um, uh, people like Frank Smith and Ken Goodman, mm -hmm. that I think comprehension uh, came on center stage. And then it really came on center stage in the mm -hmm. 70s with the uh, cognitive revolution mm -hmm. and the, the whole emphasis on um, you know, cognitive psychology and what implications it had for reading. And of course, when you think of that, you think of the Center for the Study of Reading at the University mm -hmm. of Illinois, which is uh, where I had the privilege of working for 17 years uh, from the uh, late 70s through the early 90s. And uh, we were all about uh, comprehension. As a matter of fact, we were about nothing else but comprehension. Exactly. And, uh, and a lot of our work um, uh, really emphasized uh, the important relationship between what you know and how you, how you understand what you read. Now, I know that doesn't sound like a very uh, exciting under, uh, you know, insight that, that uh, what you take away from a, a page is conditioned by what you bring to it, but really it was, uh, I, I think, a, a really important insight. And then all the implications that it had uh, for uh, teaching uh, uh, comprehension. So I, I think that there were three important uh, uh, sort of outcomes uh, of, the, of, the, of the work at the Center for the Study of Reading. And it wasn't just the center, lots of other people were doing it too. The first was that we understand what's new in terms of what we already know, uh, and hence the importance of, uh, you know, in schools of wide reading. Why? Because, you know, uh, the reading that kids do in school is a source of knowledge. Uh, you know, today's new knowledge is to exactly. tomorrow's prior knowledge, uh, and the like. That's important. Uh, secondly, it, it's important because it it, um, it suggests that uh, we need to be mindful of. Uh, uh, kids' cultural heritage uh, and the like, because uh, if you understand what's new in terms of you, what you already know, then what you bring yeah. in terms of your language, your your uh, your cultural understandings and insights is going to be an, is going to be important. And what we always have to do is to make sure uh, that we um, uh, that we bridge from what kids know to what we would like them to know and the like. And so often, I, I think we have a a different attitude, and that is we ask the question, what, do, uh, what don't kids know and how can I get it yeah. into their heads? Yep. And, and it really it has to be the other way around. What do they know and how can I use that as a resource uh, for getting them uh, to uh, a new level of understanding and the like? So I think th both of those implications are really important. A second really important I insight, I think, from uh, the center's work and, and the work of others was that uh, there's a whole, um, there's a whole uh, set of uh, metacognitive uh, routines and, and processes that we use as readers to uh, basically fix things up when they aren't going very well. And I think that the, uh, the insight about the metacognitive processes mm -hmm. is, was really important. And that, of course, has led in uh, current days to the whole strategy instruction movement, which is all about what are strategies. Strategies are nothing but uh, sort of uh, taking processes that are sometimes sort of out there and they just sort of happen on their own and slowing them down and looking at, looking at them purposely and inten intentionally and uh, deliberately so we can understand you know what those processes are and make them work for us when they, they might not be uh, doing so otherwise exactly. so so I like to think of uh, that whole strategy movement as being the legacy of uh, the metacognitive research that was done by people like Ann Brown and Anne Marie Palinksar and, and Rand Spiro at the Center for the Study of Reading in those days. And I think the third important um, uh, outcome from uh, that research was uh, that uh, uh, reading comprehension can be taught. Exactly. That is, that it, it doesn't have to just be caught. And, and, and so when you, uh, and you remember uh, Dolores Durka's, Durkin's <laughs> famous, if not infamous, study in the late 1970s uh, when she, uh, you know, observed uh, intermediate grade classroom teachers yep. for some, I don't know, 14,000 hours and found like, you know, 11 minutes devoted to uh, direct instruction and comprehension. And, uh, and, and what she mainly found was people assessing comprehension either in writing with assign work, worksheet assignments or orally in, 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 in discussions of text, which really weren't so much discussions as they were inquisitions. Yes, right. question and answer. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so I think uh, that um, 
uh, the work that a whole bunch of people uh, in the early 70s uh, did, certainly uh, students with whom I uh, worked, uh, like uh, Jane Hansen and Christine Gordon and uh, yourself, uh, Anne, and <laughs> Meg Gallagher and uh, a, a host of others, Linda Fielding, all suggested that if we go after teaching comprehension directly, we can actually improve uh, the set of strategies and skills, and I, and I don't mind using the word skill either, that you bring to the table uh, when you're uh, coping with uh, a challenging text. And so I, th those to me are the really uh, big insights that came from that period. Well, we are obviously very indebted to the work because we've spent so much time since then focusing on much of this. And so what we're kind of wondering now is sort of where, what do you see in the future? What do you see, what are kind of the exciting, what's on the horizon for comprehension, for thoughtful reading practice? coming up in front of us? Well, actually, uh, uh, I think we're in the middle of a renaissance in reading comprehension uh, instruction. And it, it seems uh, after about a decade of uh, kind of uh, mm -hmm. maintaining a low profile, it seems to be, you know, sort of uh, experiencing this renaissance right now. And I see, I see lots more research funds available for reading comprehension. Right. I, if you look at the uh, professional literature, I mean, uh, 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 work uh, like yours on strategies that work, uh, the, and, and also a host of other books by colleagues of yours that, that emphasize uh, what teachers can do to actually help kids develop this, uh, this strategic infrastructure to help them uh, uh, cope with uh, the challenges of text. It, it's really encouraging. And actually, you know, as I think about it, uh, it seems to me that there are three phases of comprehension instruction that are important. And, um, and uh, in, in a perfect world, I'd like to see uh, these sort of... Uh, uh, put together in a package. Uh, the first is uh, ensuring that kids uh, do get a chance to develop uh, this infrastructure of, uh, mm -hmm. of strategies. Uh, you know, um, first of all, figuring out uh, what problems you are having with text, and then having this set of strategies like uh, you know, uh, making connections with other parts of the text, with your knowledge, and uh, with other texts and the like, and and. Uh, uh, the, the whole set of um, summarizing, you know, the, right. the things that, that you guys emphasize in your book. Yeah. I think that's one clear component mm -hmm. uh, of, of good instruction. It seems to me the second clear component uh, of, of solid comprehension instruction isn't so much teaching it directly as it is fostering it in rich discussions about a range of text you read. And that, there's no substitute for really, really uh, 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 high-level uh, discussions uh, of the ideas uh, that uh, uh, come out of reading uh, text, and uh, here I'm. Uh, I, I'm talking, and I'm talking not only about uh, stories, narratives, which uh, right. uh, have a lot of meat to talk about in terms of, uh, you know, the the big themes themes of human experience, uh, life, uh, death, trust, <laughs> betrayal, <laughs> friendship, yeah. uh, you know, all those all those kinds of things, but also. Also, the, um, the informational texts that, that kids read uh, deserve uh, thoughtful questions on the part of teachers. But they also deserve uh, a kind of instruction. And this, to me, is the really important part of rich talk about text. Uh, kids need to learn to take over some of that questioning stuff for themselves. That is, you can't leave kids in a situation uh, where they, they only can respond to the questions that teachers ask. They have to learn how to ask those questions for themselves. And see, this is where Rich talk about text goes back to the strategy thing, because we all know that one of the important strategies that we teach kids is how to ask important questions about text, because that helps us learn and remember the information better. So there's a good example of where talk about text and strategies, I think, interact really, really and mesh. Well. And the third piece I would add is um, I've been very impressed in the past uh, six or seven years with uh, a, a comparable renaissance in vocabulary instruction. Mm -hmm. I just think that the work of uh, uh, people like uh, Isabel Beck and Marty yeah. McEwen and helping us figure out what kinds of words to mm -hmm. teach and when to teach them I, I, is, uh, is really dramatic. And if you look at what they're doing mm -hmm. in, in, in promoting uh, rich, uh, in, in promoting vocabulary development, they're really asking uh, teachers to engage, uh, interestingly enough, more often after reading than before Absolutely. reading 
in rich talk about words, exactly. right? And if you look at their, uh, uh, their vocabulary expansion activities, it's all about using the oral language to enhance and enrich and expand kids' uh, uh, oral language repertoires in relationship to words that they find in, in, in text. So they're and really ideas and concepts. Yes, more than, exactly. I mean, it's, right. Right. it's not your typical yeah. version of... And, you know, tier two okay. words, that, you know, they have those three tiers of words where tier one mm -hmm. words are just sort of like the everyday high frequently high frequent mm -hmm. words of, uh, of oral and, and written discourse the thes and the ofs and the ends and the alsos right those words that we see a lot the tier two words which are, are I mean, well actually tier three words are the technical words that we tend to find right. in science and social studies and mathematical mm -hmm. kinds yes. of text content area stuff and and those are interesting because those tend to exist in rich conceptual networks of ideas. And I actually think that things like semantic mapping, feature analysis, building complex webs of ideas are the way to deal with tier three words. But the tier two words are, are interesting because they're really words for which we have a fundamental mm -hmm. uh, 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 conceptual understanding, uh, a word like, let's say, pretty, mm -hmm. uh, but for which there exist all these other rarer words that uh, right. are characteristic of the kinds of language that literate people use. And it's really helping kids acquire that kind of uh, language that's important. So, it's, so in addition to pretty or beautiful, you also want them to know uh, what, uh, what is added if you use a word like gorgeous or stunning or uh, ravishing. ravishing. <laughs> yeah, exactly, those kinds of things. So coming to understand the, the, the nuances of right. language, right? And it's that old distinction between denotative language, right? Mm. Denotative meaning what, mm. what this word denotes out there in the world and connotative mm. uh, meaning, which is uh, all the extra baggage and nuance that y using one word versus another. Um, mm. yeah. Uh, you know, uh, brings to the table, and 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 I just think that those three, those three things together, uh, really solid strategy instruction, uh, where we help kids develop this infrastructure of tools that they can use um, uh, during reading when the going gets tough, uh, just really lively and engaging talk about text, mm -hmm. and then rich talk about words. Uh, right. Put those three things together, I think you got a great comprehension curriculum. That's great. The whole uh, concept of the gradual release of responsibility, David, it's had a huge effect, I think, on the work that we've done, the work that many teachers all over the country have done. It's made a huge impact on, on instruction. Would you talk a little bit about that? Well, you know, actually, the, the, the gradual release of responsibility is actually an idea that I stole uh, from, uh, from my colleague at the Center for the Study of Reading at the time, Joe Campione. No, I didn't actually steal it. I actually attributed it to uh, uh, articles that he ha had uh, written with, um, with Ann Brown. And, uh, and it, it also comes, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a natural um, bridge from uh, uh, that Bruner's notion of scaffolding, which came out in, in, in the, in the uh, 60s and 70s, too. And, and, and the basic idea is that... Uh, you start off with a situation where you as a teacher, you know, you're, uh, you're, you possess the, the knowledge and you know how to do these things and you're, you're, you're modeling. And when you're in modeling mode, you're taking 100% of the responsibility for doing something. The kid's taking 0%. And at the other end of this continuum is where a kid is taking 100% of the responsibility, you're taking none. You're just standing around watching, right? <laughs> and, and so uh, the idea is to get from 100% teacher and zero student to 100% uh, student and zero teacher. Right. And uh, it's, it's a really interesting notion because I find that I can apply that notion within a lesson. Mm -hmm. That is, when I'm teaching a lesson on uh, summarizing, for example, you start off with some teacher modeling and then you might do, uh, uh, go through a, a paragraph or a short passage together and the kids do part of it, the teacher does part of it, we're sort of sharing responsibility. And then you might end up in that same lesson with, okay, go do this piece on your own, right? So it works that way within a lesson. It surely works over time between lessons, yeah, right? right? So when you're doing the first right. summarization right. lesson, you're taking more responsibility than, than you are in the 10th one and the like. And it seems to me that uh, 
Uh, the other thing that, that's important to notice, note about the gradual release of responsibility is it's not a straight line down that graph from all mm -hmm. teacher to, and no student to all student and no teacher. You know, you come back on a weekend and you say, my goodness, they haven't remembered a thing I taught them and you back up <laughs> back there. Up, that's right. Yeah, and you know, and you're down all around and things like that. And I think it, it, it works great. By the way, uh, I also have learned that it applies very much to um, child rearing. There's <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And, and most other, most other uh, mentoring relationships. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you think about the notion of apprenticeship, that's what apprenticeship exactly. is all about, yeah. right? Yeah. And if you think about uh, <clears throat> the notion of uh, mentoring, Exactly. Uh, they're, they're all about uh, moving up and down that gradual release of responsibility. So I found it a, a very powerful notion, and it seems to me it's the essence of good teaching. Well, in that guided it? practice piece, I mean, yeah. I just have noticed in my own teaching and working with teachers that whenever we've, we've gone too quickly to kids working on their own independently, yeah. it's because we didn't engage in that guided practice, which is where all that great conversation that you were just talking about in terms yeah. of yeah. being so important to instruction really, really happens. Because yeah. I think sometimes uh, we, we got the modeling idea, right. but then we sort of quickly jump Skip sometimes right to Yeah, to you go from modeling practice. to independent practice. practice. Right. That's yeah, a and big there's problem. That, yeah, in the, in the uh, article that Nell Duke and I did a couple mm -hmm. of years ago, we actually uh, took the gradual release of responsibility and mapped, um, you know, there's a piece that uh, Taffy, uh, Raphael, and Kathy Au did where they talk about different, uh, they use different verbs to describe teaching. They have modeling and, uh, you know, direct, direct instruction, instruction and uh, all the way down to Participate. participation, facilit right. well, facilitating, facilitation and participation right. are the last two. Right. And then there's some stuff in the middle and I can't remember the names, but we took their terms, mapped them onto mm -hmm. the gradual lease of responsibility and divided the, 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 the space into three areas, primarily teacher, primarily student, and this region of shared sure. responsibility. And I think what you're saying is that it's this region of shared responsibility that's so important yeah. in terms of instruction. And you know, if you want to now map uh, uh, Vygotsky's no notion of the zone of proximal development onto that, that's the, mm -hmm. the, the region of shared responsibility is where you're working in that zone of proximal development. You know, releasing just enough responsibility so that kids can reach just beyond where that's they right. can really grasp on their own. And right. That's where they're really engaged. I mean, that, you know, I mean, sure, they're interested in watching us model, but right. you know, where they're really engaged is in that. Well, and I think we've been part. thinking a little bit about an, a sort of another little component be beyond guided practice, which is what we're, we've been calling collaborative practice, which right. sort of is, is now the teacher is even even further away, but kids are collaborating and practicing right. together. So almost another another piece before mm -hmm. independence mm -hmm. practice, which then gives them even more support. You know, um, well the good thing the good thing that. about collaborative practice, if you think about it, is that one of the things it does is inevitably, if you have kids work together on something, some will know more That's than others, exactly. be better than others. So kids now get to play a bit of the mentoring kind of role, right. right, in 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 that situation, and you know it, it, you go back to Vygotsky again in the mm -hmm. zone of proximal development, and his notion was is that the teacher isn't the only one exactly. who can play that mentoring role. He talked about the more knowledgeable other, right. which could just as easily be another student, student. as it, as it is it could be a teacher, right. So I think that all that fits together in in one nice uh, package. We talk about gradually releasing text so that initially when we launch a strategy or do some explicit instruction, we do it in the most accessible, interesting, compelling text mm -hmm. so kids can get a handle on it. As they get a handle on what we're asking them to do, we can then release, we can increase the difficulty of the text. You, you and, 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 and the... And the <laughs> Lack of engagement. Yeah, in the text. It's true. No, yeah. because so if they get good right, at, if yeah. they get good at doing okay, something. Guys, okay, guys. Now you're ready for the really boring stuff. <laughs> <laughs> no, but there, but there is some truth that you can you can give them a text. You wouldn't want to launch a strategy in a textbook probably, but if you get them to do an informational text strategy pretty well, then say okay. After some great text, let's try it in something that may not engage you at the same level. Right. And well, it seems to work. Or that's it much more difficult yeah. because that's you know where you're going. Or in more terms boring, of, uh, frankly, yeah. it could be both. Yeah. But it does seem to work. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you launch it in the most the least accessible text, right. 
we sunk right from the beginning. You know? No, I, and, and as a matter of fact, you know, uh, if you want to carry this argument about mm -hmm. scaffolding and yeah. responsibility even further, texts vary in the degree to which that they scaffold things for the students. Absolutely. Some texts really helps you out. It tells right. you where you're headed and exactly. what's coming next and things like that. And other text is just uh, completely uh, uh, leaves you on your own. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's, consider it. Yeah, that's right. Uh, what, What's that, that was, old distinction? Yeah, Tom Anderson and Bonnie right. Armbruster came up with that notion of being considerate text. Considerate text. Yeah, right. They wrote a great piece uh, called um, mm. Easy Reading is Damned Hard Writing. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Right. For authors yeah, to have right. to write. Okay. Interesting. Well, text matters, that's for sure. And how we use sure it does. with kids really right. makes a difference. Our sense is that writing about reading, writing about what it is that you read, responding to it, you know, what the, what the piece makes me think about, those kinds of areas, it, it, do you believe that pretty much, that really enhances their understanding of the text to write about it? Do they discover some thinking about what they read through writing? What do you think? Sure. I, I think that uh, when you write in response to reading, uh, one of the things that happens to you is that uh, you have to, um, uh, the difference between saying something yeah. and writing about it right. is that when you write about it, the words talk back to you. When you say it, they don't talk back to you. So when they talk back to you, then you have to say, gosh, is that what I really think? You know, so it, it causes this sort of second order kind of uh, m metacognitive process where you have to think, is that what I really mean? Right. It's almost like yeah. in built-in monitoring because yeah, yeah. you That's look at thinking. it and you yeah. then you reconsider it or you or you like listening agree to that, with listening your, to that listening inner, inner voice. voice right. you know? yeah. We do have to be careful about okay. it though because uh, because we do know that there are huge individual differences mm -hmm. amongst kids and their capacity to use writing as a tool okay. for responding to reading. And we, we just know that there are lots of kids who if you talk to them will have lots more to say about the text right. and if you ask them exactly. to write about it. Just as surely there are other kids who when you talk to them, especially in a group setting, won't have much to say. But when they write about it, you exactly. say, my goodness, this kid yeah. really did understand this yeah. text. Yeah. So w we need to be sensitive to the fact that there are individual differences in, if you will, response preferences. Uh, Ex well, that, it, that sort of leads into my next question, which is how talk about reading impacts kids' understanding. And, and you're speaking right now about the fact that for some kids, talk may impact their understanding more, and for some kids, writing may, I guess, impact their understanding. Sure, uh, and, and I think, but talk is really important because when, when I read a text, I build a model of meaning for it. It's a model of meaning that, uh, that allows me to account for the maximum amount of information from the text, right? Yeah. I mean, this is what Walter Kinch uh, believes about, it. what does he call it, the situation model, yes. right? Which is basically a model of meaning that, that, that accounts for as many of the, uh, uh, of the ideas uh, that I took from the text as I possibly can account for. Uh, that's my ideal model of meaning. But now, when I now have a conversation with the two of you about a text, I may say, oh gosh, I never thought of it that way before. And what happens? My model of meaning has changed. So it seems to me that talk about text is, is an opportunity for us all to revise what mm -hmm. we think the text means. Right, okay? exactly. And so, yeah, uh, and, and so that's great. And, and what that means is that just as in writing, we're, we're constantly revising. So in reading, we're constantly revising our model of meaning. And which, using talk to do that. Using talk to do that, right. Using writing to do it. All, all of those are invitations for me to uh, change my mind about what I think the text means. <laughs> That's so great. It's a great. Invitations to change one's mind. What a great notion. It's terrific. But we've been talking more about the reader's uh, mm. inner language, inner voice, their response in writing. How about the language of instruction for teachers and, and how powerful that is and how much difference it makes in terms of what our kids get as we teach them, or not what they get, but right. what they understand <coughs> as we, as we well, teach Well, if, if you want to be successful yeah. in school, you have to learn how to talk school. 
just as if you want to be a successful engineer, you have to learn how to talk like an engineer. If you want to be a, a, right. a successful, uh, you know, uh, 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 TV director, you have to learn how to talk th that that right. kind of language. And and uh, and what we know from discourse and, uh, theory, um, people like Jim G, is that uh, every community of practice has uh, a, a way of uh, being, right. doing, and talking, and um, and. School is no exception to that, and so there there is a kind of a discourse of schooling that kids have to learn. And to the degree that you learn it, uh, you will be more or less successful as a participant in in, in, in that uh, uh, community. And the uh, problem is is that we have um, an inequity in mm -hmm. terms of natural access to that because uh, lots of kids, middle class kids in particular, sort of get that uh, discourse of schooling for free at home right. because. Uh, they often, uh, their parents and siblings and uh, often talk like books and talk like school. And so they come to school, you know, uh, much more, much more, more ready to participate in that discourse. Other, other kids have to be encouraged to, uh, to participate in it. So yeah, teachers need to uh, uh, worry about that and worry about whether or not uh, their students in their class understand the language of instruction and the language of participation and the like. And you see this, you see this all the time in classrooms. I, I, I mean, I've seen some really great classrooms, even even classrooms with kids who are all in, in English language learners, where mm -hmm. I kids, hear kids say things like, "Well, I sort of agree with you, but I want to add this point." Yeah. And 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 uh, and um, you know, uh, gosh, that's an interesting answer. What makes you think so? Uh, what those kids have done is that they've acquired this sort of academic language of mm -hmm. participation in, in talk about text. And it's also, it's not just in, it's not just in, in literature classes, it's also right. in social studies yeah. and science yeah. classes. And furthermore, the academic discourse in social studies and science carries with it an additional responsibility mm -hmm. and an additional obligation yeah. to help kids uh, understand the, the kind of the, um, the process words uh, uh, of, uh, of those uh, mm -hmm. disciplines. Uh, Things like investigate, inquire, infer, uh, all of, all of those right. kinds of words that interpret. That I, interpret. Yeah. And if yeah. you don't have, uh, if you're not able to use those words, if you're stuck mm -hmm. with do and think and try, uh, then yeah. you know you, yeah. you don't get uh, really uh, far into that discourse. So, yeah, and and we, uh, I think that it's a combination of some explicit instruction but with a whole lot of participation because we know from the research on discourse acquisition mm -hmm. that uh, uh, participation is the key. But you've got to have an open setting in which That's kids right. feel comfortable participating. Otherwise, it's hard for them to acquire uh, that kind of language. But we also have found in our work uh, with teachers mm -hmm. that you can help them scaffold it. So if, 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 if for example, I want to encourage uh, the language of agreement and disagreement, uh, and uh, you say something as a student, right. I can say, does anyone want to disagree with what Stephanie had to say? I can, I can, I can invite kids into that uh, uh, conversation and also invite them to use the language. Uh, that's a part of it. Well, you alluded to informational text, and certainly nonfiction has become a hot genre of late. And I think publishers are, are publishing more and more, and teachers are more likely to have nonfiction text, informational text, other than textbooks solely, which is all they had for many years in their classrooms. Right. So what sort of impact do you think this sort of increased amount of nonfiction informational text kind of reading will have on student achievement and and what is sort of the role you see in literacy instruction, the role for nonfiction? Well I'm I, I'm thrilled to yeah. see a nonfiction text uh, uh, you know making a, a headway in, you, in, you in, in, yeah, right into the into the um, uh, trade book marketplace in, in schools uh, I, for a lot of reasons. One of which is that uh, uh, I love stories, and 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 I know that, uh, and I don't ever want us to uh, lose uh, the liter literature-based reading tradition. Uh, but I but I also think that um, that uh, it's important to have nonfiction texts uh, because there are some kids 
uh, who just really relate to that so much yes. better than they do to narratives and, and the like. And, and uh, having that available as a resource for them to encourage wide reading on their part is absolutely essential. The other thing that's important about nonfiction texts is that so much of the everyday reading that people do in the world mm -hmm. is really reading nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Newspapers, magazines, right. uh, brochures, uh, memos at work, uh, and, yes. and the like. Uh, so, so it's important that we, we make sure that kids understand uh, how writers put those together mm -hmm. and what the consequences are of using uh, some language structures over others. And right. so I'm a big believer in teaching kids about genres of, uh, of both fiction and nonfiction and making sure they understand uh, how they're structured and, and, and what, what the structure buys you in terms of both writing as a writer and a reader. Um, I also am um, uh, completely convinced that really it, it, it makes much more sense to view what we do in reading and writing as tools for learning. And, and, and the reason that we want kids to use you know, um, strategies um, is, is not for the sake of using strategies, it's for the sake of helping them acquire information. Absolutely. And the other thing that I've uh, convinced of is that um, uh, <coughs> reading and writing should never be viewed as alternatives to knowledge acquisition in social studies and science. So that is, you don't just want a, a, a yeah. written curriculum in, in, in social studies and science. What you want to do right. is to uh, honor the notion of inquiry, which is at the heart of both science and social studies, a slightly different kind of inquiry, but right. inquiry right. nonetheless, and ask yourself, uh, what's the role of reading and writing in an inquiry-based yes. science uh, uh, curriculum? Uh, not, uh, you know, uh, is reading and writing a good alternative to an inquiry-based right. science curriculum? And, and you know, I'm working out with uh, my colleagues up at Lawrence Hall of Science right now on, a, uh, on, on exactly a project like that. And okay. it, we just find that uh, uh, the, the reading and writing activities make so much more sense in science <laughs> when they're embedded in, when, when they're put in the service uh, of acquiring uh, uh, scientific knowledge as well as scientific processes. Uh, you know, the acquisition of inquiry-based science is about learning substantive stuff, but it's also about learning how to do and, and act and be like a scientist. And so our mantra in that work is um, read it, write it, talk it, do it. And you put those together and I think you really can contextualize reading and writing activities uh, uh, very nicely. We also find that there's incredible synergy between the kinds of things that we talk about as uh, important comprehension processes, uh, you know, things like drawing inferences or uh, things like making predictions, uh, and, and, and comparable processes in science, yeah. although sometimes the language is a little different. Like a hypothesis. Yeah, or, exactly. Asking, asking questions. Asking yeah. questions yeah. are something that's common to both, yeah. Right. Making predictions. predictions uh, and uh, Drawing conclusions. Drawing conclusions, uh, yes. Uh, yeah. And what differs sometimes is what the data sources are, right? Because mm -hmm. in reading uh, comprehension, the data sources are almost all, always ideas from the text. Whereas when you're doing science, you have the data from your primary investigations. But the other thing that we do is we regard reading as a source of gaining information, not from primary, but from secondary investigations. Mm -hmm. That is, reading about what other people did. So we try to include texts where mm -hmm. uh, we always have a, a text in our unit about a story about a scientist mm -hmm. and, and his work and how he uh, right. you know, uh, uh, proceeds and the like. And then that becomes a secondary kind of investigation. Mm -hmm. But it really, uh, the, the synergy between them is remarkable. And uh, I'm becoming a, a big believer that the best way uh, for us to promote um, uh, reading and writing in the content areas is to lead with the uh, disciplinary goals and let uh, the literacy support those. Right. They're the means to an end. Exactly. Yeah. And I, actually, that's a really good point, yeah. Anne, because I think that we, we want to we think about uh, uh, reading and writing and language processes more generally as um, tools to support learning. You yeah. know? Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I actually believe that in our teacher ed programs mm -hmm. that we need to think about language and literacy as um, kind of a foundational uh, yeah. set of understandings just as th that as theories of learning and theories of motivation are, are foundational yeah. I think it's we've we've gotten off track by pushing reading and writing out there as a separate 
subject matter. And it would be better to yes. think, of it at, think of it like learning and motivation as foundational to learning about things in other areas. And then people always ask, well, what about literature? And when I, what, the way I treat literature is it seems to me that literature is best thought of as, if you will, the subject matter of English. Yes, yeah, exactly. literature. Yeah. Literature is yeah, more like yeah. you can think of literature as comparable to science or social yep. or right. history, right. right? It's the content. But, but 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 then but then the procedure, the process stuff, is can be applied across right. all three of those domains exactly. of learning. Yeah. So so it's literature. Its own discipline. Yes, anyway. literature yes. Is, is more like a discipline, yes. right? Whereas uh, the the reading writing stuff is more like tools, right? Well, and one of the things that we're, we've been thinking a lot about, and it goes, I think, to your notion of wide reading, I think, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about it, which is we also agree that kids need to read widely in the content areas, but one of the things about informational text that I, I find so appealing for kids is that they can also read widely in, in the informational realm outside of their content areas and find out about, so they're not doing extreme weather, but they, we see a tsunami and suddenly they can read you know, extensively about right. hurricanes or how those things happen because that's happened here, you know, or in, or in this world at this time. Or, so the idea of sort of reading broadly and widely across informational areas that may may or may not be related to the right. content area as well, you know? I mean, well, it's a tool to explore the world yeah. as opposed to, you know, exactly which encompasses all those disciplines. I mean, I, I think right. it's... Uh, right, exactly, that notion. No, and I, and I think that the thing we need to understand, and I, what I don't think we've worked out quite yet, mm -hmm. is I actually don't think uh, that um, the processes look exactly the same in science as they do in social right. studies, as yeah. they do in literature. I think that they have strong family resemblances to one another as they move across those disciplines, mm -hmm. but they're instantiated differently. They, uh, they're, uh, they're operationalized differently. And we need to understand more about uh, how that works too. But, but I think that's a, a wonderful agenda for you know, um, this upcoming generation of, uh, of scholars of literacy. Assessments is such a such a big issue now, such an important issue, such a driving issue in so much of what we do in education now. How do we how do we keep it authentic and child centered and thoughtful uh, mm -hmm. in a assessment? Ah. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, the the reason I'm uh, shrugging with respect to assessment is, as you know, I spent about 20 years <laughs> trying to uh, make some headway in assessment and. Uh, I just feel like it's uh, you know two steps forward and ten steps mm. backward. Uh, it's such a it's such a tough issue, especially now mm -hmm. that we've attached such high stakes to it, right? And uh, you know, in the early in the mid '80s to early '90s, uh, the goal mm -hmm. that we all had in mind is well, you know, accountability's here, assessments here to stay, and what we need to do is to develop. Uh, if people are going to teach to the test, let's develop tests worth teaching to. Right. And that was uh, that was the goal of uh, the kind of uh, stuff we did in Illinois with the state assessment there, where we had, qu you know, t uh, tests with uh, questions that had more than one right answer, because we wanted kids to, right. to know that that you know things are complicated and there's not just one right answer right. to every question. Uh, we also had um, tests of um, metacognitive processes mm -hmm. on that, and again, you know, we. We're, we're sending out a message to teacher that these things were important to teach. Well, I think what we learned uh, in those early days is that uh, uh, that when uh, when a, a test has high stakes attached to it, mm -hmm. uh, that people will teach to it, and they'll teach to it uh, in, in a surface way, not in a deep way. And what I mean by that is they'll have kids practice items that look just like the items on the test, and and then what you have is an unfortunate circumstance where a, a test is uh, serving uh, the the default role of a curriculum, mm -hmm. and you know, and one of my uh, one of my uh, principles of life is you should never send a test out to do a curriculum's job. They just aren't up to it. Uh, they will they will narrow the curricular focus. <laughs> They'll get uh, uh, teachers who know better. Will spend all kinds of time uh, having kids practice these things that in the long run don't serve either their interests or their kids' interests very well. 
you want people to do better on tests, but not because you taught you had them practice right. that test format for you know uh, twelve Once, hours before right, they took the right. the test. You want people to do better on like standardized tests because they've learned more information, yeah. and because they have uh, uh, this rich infrastructure of skills and strategies that can adapt to a variety of situations and can transfer to a whole mm -hmm. set of tasks, including standardized tests. Right. Uh, so you want people right. to do better on them, uh, not because you practice them all the time. I'll tell you my, my favorite story to illustrate uh, this kind of mindless thing is that when my kids were, um, were, were um, preteens and teens, was about the time that, um, mm -hmm. what's that game? Uh, Trivial Pursuits came out. Right. And uh, when we first started playing, you know, uh, I, of course, you know, uh, could beat them all the time. But then, but then I discovered over time that they were getting better and better at it. And I realized what they were doing. They were actually memorizing, memorizing the all the answers to all the cards. <laughs> And you know, and, and I came by my trivial knowledge honestly through years and years. <laughs> you worked of, hard for yeah, it, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but but it seems to me that 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 that, that that's what happens yep. when you when you teach to the test too closely is that you trivial wow. you trivialize it. To, and um, uh, but but it's a really tough situation because I know that teachers and schools are under incredible pressure to increase those test scores. And I'm not sure that it matters what the test is. I think any time yeah. you attach those high stakes to it. Uh, you can manage to uh, corrupt even the best of assessments. And, 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 and the question is, if you had performance assessments and portfolios, would it be any better? You know, I can imagine mindless, I know, packing to the portfolio as, you know, like <laughs> teaching to the test. So it may be the stakes uh, that, that, that cause us to do things that we know are neither in our best interest nor, nor our students' best interest, but, but, but we're under such pressure to uh, to do well on those external measures that we we seem not to resist the temptation uh, to do this direct teaching to the test. Now, what do I want? What I'd like to see is I don't think we're ever going to get rid of accountability. I think it's here to stay for the next century or two. Um, and uh, uh, so I think that we need to find a way to live with it. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that what we need to do is to... Uh, Encourage policymakers and uh, and teachers and and everyone to uh, adopt a, a kind of a let's find the right tool for the right purpose, right? And so, to me, assessment is about matching audience, who needs the information, with purpose. What question do you want to answer, or what decision do you have to make with the test? You know, and what. What tools do I have available to help me to get that information so we can answer this question? Right? And let's not forget that if you have this client-centered approach to mm -hmm. assessment, that the first and most important client in your assessment system should be the student, yeah. because that's the person whose life is most deeply affected uh, by the test you use. So I'm all for multiple measures. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and I, I'm in, I, I'd like to include a standardized test. Uh, I don't have any problem with that, but I'd also like to see uh, the return of the uh, energy and the um, authenticity that I think was so much a part of the performance assessment movement in the early 1990s. I thought we were headed down the right road. We couldn't get the psychometrics right. We couldn't show that we had cost-effective, reliable, uh, generalizable right. assessments uh, of processes, but it's only because we didn't invest enough time and energy in it. Right. Uh, and, and I think that the, as a field, we need to go back and we need to roll up our sleeves and work a lot harder so that we have those kinds of authentic assessments that can meet not only uh, the uh, conceptual standards that we want for good reading assessments, but also the psychometric standards that we demand for making decisions of consequence about individuals and groups. What do you think about, you know, we, we're faced with sort of two different issues, I think in classrooms where teachers are really working on and helping kids l learn to think and teaching strategic comprehension and those kinds of things. T teachers are asking for how do you assess how do you assess thinking? How do you determine it, you know if, if we're going to get rid of asking 10 literal questions at the end of a you know passage in class in a worksheet. They they want to know how to sort of assess that because they tell us, teachers tell us that once they begin to teach kids to ask questions, to 
in, to think about to think inferentially. Kids do much better. They it just they demonstrate they're more thoughtful. They seem to understand better. But how do you sort of translate that into a some, test score? Yeah, yeah. I mean, some or some sort of a grade, as opposed to even the a standardized test, but just. How do you report that to parents? You know those kinds. Yeah, of but issues. I mean, when you get to those, when you get to that kind of uh, uh, more complicated stuff, right? I mean, I think that's where things like rubrics come in, okay. right. and we and that's what we use rubrics for. We use right. rubrics in situations where uh, where we don't want to, you know, just, just count up the number of answers. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 And and, and I, th I think that's that's one option you have. Yeah. I also think that we could do a better job of actually uh, developing. Um, some paper and pencil assessments okay. uh, of these processes. You know, uh, another um, another uh, uh, thing I, I like to, another idea that I like to bring into the assessment conversation is, uh, uh, I, I call it, how far will the learning travel, right? Mm -hmm. So if I've taught you how to ask questions, right? Yeah. One of the things I wanna know is, well, can you ask questions? So I, I give you a text and I, I, I say, uh, generate 10 questions that you think would help, would tell you whether or not another kid understood the story, right? right. So that's a direct assessment of the strategy I've taught. Uh, now, uh, you know, I might have one over here where it says, you know, uh, in Mrs. Smith's class, the kids were asked to do this, and here's 15 questions uh, that they generated. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, which ones uh, would, you, would you not include? You know, and okay. you have to check those. And then, you know, then I say, then over here I have a new text, and, uh, you know, and, and uh, uh, I, I don't know, maybe the task now is not so much about asking questions but answering them. Uh, and I want to know whether or not if you, if you get good at asking questions, does it transfer to a a answering, answering questions? It. And maybe over here is a standardized test. And to me, what I think you need in an assessment is a theory of transfer, which says, did I learn what you, did you, did I learn what you taught right. me? Then can I apply it to a new situation? And then does it make a difference in my sort of general comprehension? Mm -hmm. right. and, uh, and I want to know that about any intervention that you uh, use in the classroom. How far will it travel? Okay. You know, recently I think one of the things that uh, much of the work we've done and many teachers around the country have really become focused on this notion of making thinking visible, both in their, their own modeling of thinking, also in asking kids to share their thinking with each other, also in jotting down their thinking on charts for kids to share. Do you think this is going to make a, a difference for kids when, when thinking is sort of elevated out of that private place where we keep it in, out in the public? Sure, I think the notion of making your thinking public is a great idea. Uh, uh, I, I, there's other metaphors I like for it too. One is um, is uh, sharing the secrets uh, uh, of your academic successes and failures, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and, and my favorite metaphor is one I've I've uh, um, sort of uh, stolen from my math friends, and it's yeah. called show your work, right? See, in math. In math, you, you, you have to show your work yeah. because when you show your work, you can get partial credit even if you don't come up with the right answer. And in, in, it seems to me in reading comprehension that, that when we ask kids to make their thinking public, we're asking them to show their work. That's right. So that you don't just get the answer, you also get uh, the process that you went through to get that answer. And so uh, showing our work is, is, a, is a nice way to, uh, to think about uh, what it is we want kids uh, to do too. Uh, and, and do I think it's important? Absolutely, because I think some kids, uh, for some kids, um, uh, when they do reading comprehension tasks, uh, they have uh, one of two strategies. One is the big guess. Yeah. That is, just say something, say anything. Say anything. Just get the picture <laughs> of your back. And the other is, uh, is uh, uh, randomly search the text for some, something that sounds remotely Rem related to the question that question. was asked and, and, and give that as an answer. And it seems to me that neither of those strategies is very productive. So uh, to get from uh, those, uh, those um, uh, very um, uh, general and uh, not very thoughtful uh, strategies that allow you to sort of get by in classrooms that we really do need to uh, help kids understand that if they're thoughtful and careful about their reasoning that they can come up with something that's much more plausible. So yeah, that's, that, that's, that to me is why you do all that stuff.
Right. Yeah. And, and you don't just model it. It seems to me that the, the, the key thing about it is, you know, collaboratively working through problems, right? Okay. And one way to do that is to sort of, you know, a, a nice way to do that is to show a text, show a question, and show two or three answers to it. Mm -hmm. And then what we try to do is to get inside the heads of the kids mm -hmm. who came up with those answers. And what could a person be thinking to have gotten this answer or that answer? I mean, that's an, the good thing about that is that it's a disinterested way of trying to unpack thinking. Right, and ultimately you want to get to where we're sharing our thinking and the like. But sometimes a first step is to see if you can uh, uh, develop a plausible, uh, uh, you know, sort of reasoning uh, uh, trajectory for how this person could have possibly come up with this answer. Right. And I bet kids really get engaged with it. They do. They love to fun. think about yeah, their own right. thinking. Absolutely. I mean, who doesn't? You know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Thank so, you so yeah, much. Thanks. My pleasure. It's great.